Backcountry Colorado, hiking, backpacking. I did a lot of marathons. I was convinced to do some ultras. Climbing, and I do filming and photography. I just like the ultras because I love the community. I just think that everybody is so nice, whether they're the first place finishers or, you know, us that kind of mosey along. Welcome, everybody, to Dispatch Radio. We are recording live from the Mountain Toad Brewing Company here in Golden, Colorado. I want to raise a glass of delicious beer to our guests and hosts around the table and to our live audience here. Cheers. And to Chris Carrington's mom, most of all. (laughs) What we're here to do today is to talk to some really cool uh, adventurers here in the Colorado area. They all have a little bit different story, but they also have a lot in common as well. Um, so let's just go around the uh, table a little bit. Right, Nick, immediately to my left, we have Lori Nakauchi, and she's going to be one, she, you're going to be joining us as a co-host today. Yes, and I'm an ultra runner. Yeah, and then we've got next to you. Hey, what's up? I'm Corey Fain. How's it going? Just, I'm from Dispatch. Also an ultra runner. And to your left, we've got. My name is Eric Sanders. I'm a adventure racer and multi-sport athlete. World class adventure racer. We've talked about this, Eric. World class. Hi, my name is uh, Joe Grant, and I guess I'm an uh, ultra runner as well. My name is Eileen Doom, and I myself in Evolving Ultra Running. Oh, Evolving. And, and, and Eileen's got a fan base back there. I'm Chris Harrington, and I'm an ultra runner as well. A little bit about me. Yeah, and the reason that we called you all out here, uh, one is just because in this dispatch radio adventure that we've been on, uh, we've uh, gotten a chance to get to know some really interesting people. Eric Sanders, we've had you on the podcast a couple of times now. Um, If you don't know Eric, uh, go check out his story slam where he tells a terrifying story about one of his adventures in the Brazilian jungle. Uh, It'll actually, it'll make your skin crawl. Uh, Eileen, we've gotten to know. She's actually coming on board as a guest blogger for us, so you'll be hearing more from her if you check out dispatchradio.com. Uh, speaking about just uh, kind of normal people issues, you know, how do you, how do you get out an adventure when you've got kids? How do you balance a full-time career being a lawyer and still get out in the in the woods? So we've really enjoyed uh, getting to know you, Eileen, and Chris Harrington, starting with the Front Range uh, Cross Country Group, which uh, really helped me in my training as I attempted my first ultra until I broke my toe four days before uh, the Dirty 30 in a very hilarious way. Uh, If you go back to our basement stories, you can can hear that uh, full story. But Chris has been a a big supporter of of the pod, uh, and you just are really awesome. I mean, look at the audience here. This is because people are really into what you all are doing. Yes, Joe Grant is, you know, obviously a big name. He's in the newspaper. Uh, but these people are important, too. They're part of our community. Um, so, Joe, you <laughs> know, just because you're the big success. shot. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and, Joe, uh, you know, I saved you last last for all. Everybody's super excited to get to know you. Uh, I'm personally just intrigued to find out what makes a human being even want to attempt some of the things that you do uh, and to hear a little bit about the backstory. I think some of us probably came to this pod with some preconceived notions. For, for me, I said, I bet Joe Grant's quads are enormous. Um, they look, they don't look as enormous as I was thinking. (laughs) Eileen, can we have, you, you agree. (laughs) Um, but no, Joe, thank you for, for joining, uh, a a simple, a a quick background on you. You grew up in France. Uh, you kind of got a taste for the outdoors uh, over in France and just, it just kind of hung with you, uh, throughout your life. You became an ultra runner, a very competitive ultra runner. Corey, do you happen to have his, by his racing bio? I don't have it in front of me, but there's... Uh, he won a lot of stuff. Oh, you need bar, to know he, he won a lot of stuff. Joe could, Joe could probably give us a quick res- running resume. Do you want to give us a quick running res- resume? Yeah, I mean, I've um, done a variety of, uh, of racing over the years. Uh, I guess the, the main attraction I have to doing different kinds of events is um, discovering new places. And uh, I like courses that are interesting point-to-point loop courses so i've done hard rock a number of times um i've done the i did a rod 350 up in alaska um utmb in in france and and so i've, I've been lucky to, to to travel around quite a bit and um i typically do longer longer distance races so 
usually 100 miles and occasionally a little bit longer than that too. So, um, yeah, that's kind of been my... And, and you really got your start in ultra running and then kind of brought in what you did? Uh, not really. It okay. kind of came full circle, actually. I, I actually rode across the country, and uh, in, I think that was in 06, maybe. And after that trip, I decided that I was in good shape and I should probably try and run 100K um, in, uh, in Oregon, where I was living at the time. So that was actually my first official event race. Um, and it was just kind of a desire to sort of connect with the local community and explore the local trails. And I figured that the, uh, the biking experience would, uh, would kind of cross over pretty, pretty well into, into running. So, um, yeah, I definitely didn't, didn't really start as a runner, um, more just, uh, exploring being outside, um, uh, backpacking, climbing and such. And then, um, yeah, kind of reintroduced a lot of those activities over the years, um, to complement the running. And uh, I mentioned the newspaper headlines. Uh, you had a, a rather noteworthy attempt and successful attempt. Uh, do you want to tell our audience a little bit about what you did this year? Yeah. So this uh, this summer, I I completed the uh, what what we what I call the the Tour de Fourteeners, um, inspired by uh, Justin Simone, who is uh, a local guy, lives in Boulder. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, he uh, toured all the Colorado Fourteeners on a bicycle. And, and summited all the peaks um, running and hiking. So I just kind of really connected with, uh, with his style and his approach and uh, that I, I'd been wanting to do the 14 years in some, some way um, for, for a number of years. And I think that, that style just kind of uh, resonated with, he, with me the most. Um, and like I said, I, I've, been, I've been fortunate to travel quite a bit. And I th feel like every, every year I always get to the, to the end of the year and I think, okay, this year I'm going to stay in Colorado. And and, and, and explore Colorado more because there's so many great things to do. And, and it was just a matter of kind of committing to a project. And, um, and this, went, this seemed like a, a logical um, one for me to do. So our listeners aren't always well-versed in, you know, F, FKT and fastest known times. And, you know, it's, it's, some of the listeners out there, you know, really just have an interest in this world and they don't live it. Could you just uh, take us through, you said a self-propelled ascent of, you know, Colorado's, is it 57 peaks that are 14? Yeah, it's a little confusing. There's, uh -huh. there's 54 uh, official 14ers, and there's uh, actually four more that are um, named peaks, but they don't have enough uh, difference between the, the summits to be recognized as, as um, separate 14ers. So um, the reason I did 57 and not 58 was because uh, Mount Bross is a, is a private peak and close to the public. So ah. uh, I did do the the extra four um, sort of sub peaks, I guess you could call them. So um, the main numbers to know are there's 54 14ers in Colorado. Right. Yeah. Recognized 14ers. And I think there are four more that are, um, you know, not, they don't have enough difference between the, the saddle and the two summits. And the main difference is those, those extra four peaks are just a little too close to another peak to be considered their own 14er. Exactly. Is that how it works? Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. And then you decided to set out and bag all of these peaks and do it self-propelled, which means to bike to each of these trailheads, hike up the mountain, hike back down and then bike to the next one. So how many miles of travel was that? It was a total of 1,500 miles of travel, so I decided to leave from my, my house um, and just kind of push off on the bike. And um, You guys are listening to this out here? Did you hear what I said? Miles. 58 <laughs> different peaks, 1,500 miles that he biked just to go climb 14ers. Well, it's 1,500 miles total, so 1,100 yeah. miles of riding and, and 400 miles of, of running and hiking. And oh, then, okay. Well, it's <laughs> only 1,100 miles of biking, then. I take it back. <laughs> But I think, I mean, for me, the, the bike was a, a nice way to, to connect the peaks because it, it's slow enough that you, you do get to um, experience the, the scenery and, and, and enjoy a, a kind of a relatively, um, you know, nice pace. Um, but you also can cover some distance. Um, if you were covering 100 miles on foot, it would take, you know, several days between, between the peaks. A couple guys did it. I think uh, a few years ago um, as a through hike, which is another cool, cool way, I think, to, to link the peaks, but take a lot more time because, uh, you know, traveling between the mountains is there's often really long stretches of, of yeah, dirt road or, yeah. So, and, and we've got some impressive athletes on our, on our panel here, Eric and Chris and Eileen. When you, when you read about this or heard about this, I'd, I'd love to hear some reactions. Is it just me or does this sound insane? I, I mean, I, th I thought it was Chris, incredible. Chris, thank you. It, it reminded me of 
uh, what did Honold and uh, Cedar Grant do? The Sufferfest they did? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it remind, reminded me kind of that. But, yeah, I, I got inspired by it. It was great. It was awesome to read about. Eric? Yeah, I mean, I think I thought it was awesome. Uh, just a great link up of all the peaks. And, you know, if you have the time to, to do it that in that style, I think it's a great way to do it. You know, um, uh, there's another style where you where you take a car and it, it just seems a lot more logistically kind of a hassle. But biking and trekking, it seems like to me like a logical way to do it. And uh, I thought that was uh, awesome. And uh, Eric, Eileen. Yeah, I generally just thought it was amazing. I did not cross my mind anything having to do with the word insane. I just thought it was incredible. I think there were a few segments that I read about that I was just somewhat mystified. Like, how could that possibly happen in one day? But then I was just yeah. generally like... Yeah, tell us about... You had a, you had a couple of mind-boggling days where just it doesn't seem possible that you where you biked and then you climbed multiple peaks. Can you just take us through you know, a day in the life of this struggle you were on? Yeah, I mean, there were there were a lot of ups and downs. It wasn't all glamorous by any means. <laughs> and uh, the, the one of the uh, constraints that I had was uh, Culebra Peak uh, in, in the south, south, south part of Colorado is a private peak, and you, it requires a permit to climb. Um, so that permit is a single-day permit on um, July 30th. And, and logistically, I had to leave on uh, July 26th, so it gave me five days basically to get down to Culebra. Um, and on the way, there are eight peaks that make sense to, um, to, to, to summit before, before getting down to Culebra. And I say make sense because on a bicycle- Yeah, um, you don't want to leave anything. You don't want to bypass yeah. them. You don't want them to go then, back. Yeah, yeah, ride back 100 miles to, to go and do you know, some of the peaks. So it was actually quite, quite intense and stressful uh, at the start because I had this this time constraint, which meant that, you know, the bike had to, uh, had to hold up and, 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 you know, I was hoping that there was, there was going to be no issues on that front. So it definitely started with, with not a lot of sleep and, and some, some pretty massive days. Um, but what I found was just sometimes you, you, you were just really surprised at kind of what your body can do. And, and I would do a huge day and then fully expect to be destroyed the next day. And it actually went quite well. And then other days, when I felt like, okay, this is going to be an easy day and I'm sort of going to treat this as recovery day, I just felt miserable the entire time. So it wasn't, it wasn't really very linear or necessarily very logical based on, you know, the, the, the accumulation after a while just kind of gets to you. So it, it can hit you at random moments where, you know, you just, you just feel really, really, really depleted and, and, and worked where, you know, the day before you didn't necessarily do a huge day. So. And, and how long total were you out there? I was out there for 31 days and eight hours and 33 minutes, if you know. <laughs> there was, if you want to get technical. Well, yeah, and what I, was the previous record? Was there a previous record? Yeah, so Justin did. Uh, he set the standard in, in, in 34 days, 34 and a half days. Um, but I think we both, and I don't want to speak for him, but I think both of us, the, 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 really the, the premise, the idea behind the trip was to um, – kind of promote self-powered local adventure and focus less on, on time and, and records as, as something. I know that's, that's the kind of the, the click worthy thing at the end, but there's so much more to, to kind of the trip than, than just times. I mean, speed certainly plays a, a role, um, mostly with weather and being able to, to be safe and get off the, the mountains quickly and, 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 you know, in some cases link, link a bunch of peaks um, in, in a single push, which is helpful because then, you don't have to redo that mileage on the approach to, to, to go up the peaks again. So, so speed definitely was an element that, that was important in the trip, but not uh, a central focus in terms of, oh, I've got to beat this, this record or anything like that. Well, we've got a lot of people here that I know are very fascinated to talk to all of you. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of Q&A with the audience uh, after the fact. You guys out on Facebook Nation, uh, send us in your questions. We'll read them to our guest uh, once we uh, kind of uh, wrap through the host. I want to get through and, and introduce everybody uh, to the panel. Uh, Eric Sanders, uh, you're, as we mentioned, world-class adventure racer, hashtag that, own it. Uh, he's golden zone. Uh, you have done a lot of adventure racing that we've talked to a lot on the pod, and we were particularly interested in... I was, handed, I was just handed a production note. <laughs> 
we were particularly get you back because we because uh, you recently attempted Nolan's, and this has a lot to do with uh, the stuff that Joe's out there doing. Uh, the stuff that uh, I know, well, there's a lot of similarities with ultra running as well. And I know, Chris, you've got the Mount Evans triathlon now. The double, double, Mark Mars and double quinceanera of Mount Evans triathlon. <laughs> Thank you. birthday celebration. Good branding. Yeah. The, yeah. These guys at Front Range Cross Country do have branding on lockdown. Uh, but we want to hear a little bit about your Nolan's attempt. And uh, we want to take a little bit of, you know, lessons out of the similarities and the differences on, you know, something that, uh, that Joe was just describing. So Eric, tell us, uh, first of all, just explain to our audience what is Nolan's and, uh, and then take us through what you did. Um, so Nolan's is a uh, ultra running, uh, well, ultra running, just kind of a massive uh, endurance kind of effort in the Sawatch Mountains of Colorado. And you start um, at the Fish Hatchery Trailhead. I guess it's, you can go north to south or south to north. So, it, you know, your starting point is, is relative. But um, so I started at the fish hatchery trailhead and you basically go up this string of 14, uh, 14,000 foot peaks in, um, the call in the Sawatch range. And it's, it's a fairly, <laughs> it's a fairly, fairly logical link up. And that's part of the, one of the reasons why, you know, this, this line kind of, um, kind of, you know, resonates with me. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, so how, well, how many, so, so what is it? Give us a summary. How many peaks is it? It's 14, 14,000 foot peaks and roughly, you know, a hundred miles. It kind of varies based on your route choice. And that's part of the reason um, I like it also is it gives you some, some of your own, you know, intuition and what you want to do with the route, but 14, uh, roughly a hundred miles um, in 45,000 feet of elevation gain and descent. And you were attempting to do it in how long? Um, so to finish Nolan's, you have to finish in under 60 hours. Um, that's to claim that you finished. Uh, we, we've been we've finished the line. We've talked about this on the pod, and I, I say Nolan, you come here and you tell me that you have to finish it in 60 days because <laughs> who cares how long it takes you? If you do it, it's hours. it's badass either way, right? Yeah, I mean, no matter how long <laughs> it takes you, this line is is pretty incredible to finish in in one push. And uh, there are, there was a guy uh, Julian Smith that finished this year in in just you know yeah, over Julian. 60 hours. Got some Julian fans out here. Yeah, mad props and uh, you know. Whether you finish it in under the sixty hours is kind of arbitrary. I mean, it's it's an incredible line, and um, it's it's definitely an amazing uh, endurance kind of feat to just go through that distance and that. But these these mountains, so and so and so uh, as we've mentioned, you're a world class adventure racer. You're one of the top uh, uh, adventure racing teams in the planet. You compete in the world championships. You're obviously very fit and knowledgeable about the outdoors you've swum through alligator infested waters and slept with jaguars in the brazilian jungle um so when you said you were doing nolan's uh when we were on nick's porch uh, a few weeks ago i said this guy's gonna nail it uh, no pr in the bag no problem uh so you set out to do this on labor day is that right labor day weekend yep and your goal was to do it in under the 60 yeah, yeah. The the base goal was to try and complete it in under the sixty hours. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah. and and take us through it. What happened? Yeah, I mean, so Nolan's it's it's one of these things that's just these, this ultimate kind of endurance test. You know, I mean, you can be like being fit and being you know whatever is kind of like the basis of of the the challenge, and um, that's only part of it. You know, you can you can train for a marathon, you can train for a ten k, or you can train for an Ironman triathlon but something like like Nolan's and something like this big is you know the reason why you have some of these endurance athletes kind of testing themselves on this line is because it's it's one of the biggest I feel like it's one of the biggest kind of endurance feats you know out there in in the maybe in the U.S. maybe in the world right now um, it's it's at a high elevation so you don't you never drop below 8,900 feet and that's like at one point in the whole thing and you're maybe there for for uh you know an hour at the most um so it's it's at a high elevation and i think that's really um part of the killer of this whole thing is you know you have a lot of endurance athletes pushing themselves for 100 miles with a lot of elevation gain at lower al altitudes um but uh yeah since this thing is between 10,000 and 14,000 feet for 
for so long, it, it just becomes, you know, that being pushing yourself that high just drains your body so much. And that was part of what kind of played into to, um, my attempt is, um, you know, I'm used to pushing myself in these adventure races for anywhere from, you know, 24 to, to nine days. I've done a race up to nine days. Um, and, you know, you're getting sleep deprived and you're maybe getting two hours of sleep a night, you know, for this extended period of time, but rarely are you pushing yourself, um, at this extreme altitude. And, uh, for that, for that long, like, you know, you can, I can, I was in training and pushing myself up and over these peaks for 12 hours, you know, and I was feeling fine. But when you start extending it out, it starts to, uh, just wear on your body so much more. And, uh, and so yeah, what happened? So, yeah, so that happened, and, um, you know, I had some shitty weather, you know, had some altitude sickness, had all these other things, you know, you, you can, I can claim all these other excuses, but really um, what happened was I think I just lost kind of like a mental battle with uh, the Nolan's course, and, you know, I had some shitty weather on Massive and Albert, which was the, the first two peaks in my attempt, um, you know, it was snow and rain, White out conditions. Lori's nodding and a knowing, like a knowing <laughs> nod, because she did an interview with Eric Lee uh, previously a couple of weeks ago. He he had a different attempt. Lori, we'll remind our listeners what Eric's attempt was. Eric was uh, attempting the 14ers record. What is that for our uh, listeners? Um, he's it's the speed record for completing all the 14ers. But unlike Joe's attempt, you have crews. He uh, you use he, he had multiple crews. You mean he and, didn't, and he the car didn't, to get you? But he didn't car, bike yeah. from he trailhead didn't bike. to trailhead. Oh, he's Come so on. lazy. <laughs> And then what happened to Eric? Remind our listeners what happened with Eric. He, he ran into some terrible weather. I mean, from the start, he he ended up probably, like, I don't remember how many peaks in getting hypothermic. So he was unable to continue. And like Joe was saying, the Calabra cutoff was what determined his weather window. So you can't shift the days, unlike something like the Appalachian Trail, where you can sort of look at the weather window. You have to go for it when you have your permit. And, and Joe, is a lot of this sounding uh, like familiar territory to you? I mean, you also high altitude, and uh, you mentioned the kind of the stress of getting from uh, point to point. Have you attempted Nolan's? I haven't. No, is it on I, your list? Do you have any interest in it? I do. Yeah. I. I, I mean, I've I've done a lot of the peaks uh, multiple times, and um, obviously, as part of the the fourteeners, you you do the the line, but in a you know broken up way, which is 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 really different. Um, but the the challenge I think with the swatch is that it's, it's just big piles of rock and there's this this kind of grind aspect to it that's it, you know quite quite difficult. There's um, compared to say the Crestones or or the Blanca group, for instance, a little bit more engaging uh, terrain wise. Um, the swatch I because I'm so familiar with the swatch, I thought oh well I, when I get back there it's gonna be it's gonna be easier. But then you you remember it's like it's just it's just big, long climbs, and um, it's not technically difficult. It just it just wears on you. And huh. so, if there's if there's bad weather, uh, you know, and there's there's some route finding, and I guess it's just a lot of bumbly kind of terrain. It's it's just talus and and and, and some bushwhacking and, and and a bit of route finding. So I think that can can destabilize people, um, you know, quite a bit. Um, what what was your lowest point out? during your attempt well ironically it was actually on on mount antero um the southern swatch so that's the um is, that, and that, is that on the nolans yeah right. so tabaguash and shivano and and antero the last three peaks if you're going north to south um and the way i did it was i came from the san juans and wrapped around um to the to the i guess it's the north side of antero and rode up that there's a road that that leads you to about twelve thousand feet um, which is where I camped, and then I decided to go and do uh, Tab Chev, and then come back over to to Antero. So in my mind, I'd finished the San Juans, which a lot of a lot of the peaks I hadn't done, and um, I sort of oh, okay, I'm I'm on the way home. I'm in familiar territory. It's going to go well. The bike ride is about 110 miles or something from from Lake City the day before, and I felt really good on the ride. And, and was Wait, just... can I just pause there? <laughs> okay, so I signed up for the MS ride before I broke my toe. And I was bragging to my family and my friends and everybody that I knew. I was going to ride my bike 100 miles from Denver to Fort Collins. And 
this guy's rest day is riding 100 miles to the next peak that he can bag. It's just, it really puts things in perspective for me. Well, the riding's nice because you, you know, you sit on the bike. <laughs> and then, so there's a, can they, coast downhill. Well, it's a little more disengaged in terms of you don't have to. Mentally. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to focus as much. And, yeah. and you just kind of pedal the bike. And so I was, I was pretty, pretty excited to finish the San Juans and, and be in some ways heading home, like it, basically when I, when I hit the, the Southern part of the Sawatch, so the Nolan's course, um, that was about the halfway point. And, and I think you, you kind of let go a little bit mentally, um, when, when, when there's that familiarity piece, whereas peaks that I didn't know, um, I came in, you know, with more of my A game. I was like, okay, I, I need to bring it today because I'm just not sure what to expect. You know, I've read up on it. I've looked at the maps. I, I have a general idea, but not um, not so familiar. So Antero is just it's a road to the top, and it's about as kind of uninspiring of a peak as it, as it comes. And there's, there's lots of quads and, and people. It's just a, yeah. And so, so basically what I did is I went over to – Dropped down to Browns Creek and went up uh, uh, Tabaguash and Shivano and then came back over to to Antero and just kind of had a complete sort of blow up meltdown hiking up the road. Um, sat on top was this guy blasted by me on his quad and said sorry for the noise pollution and sort of just like blasted off. <laughs> you know, it was just like that the is wrong, not a fun experience. Yeah, being it was past just the wrong moment. <laughs> Um, so that, that was what does probably, that look like? What does a Joe Grant meltdown look like? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, just, Were you crying? I didn't cry there. I did cry on Albert. Um, I'd be crying every day yeah. on whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't cry that much. I cried when I saw my wife. Wouldn't uh, get out of my sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was more just like a really, really deep bonk, you know, like in, in, in running, you, you kind of experience that, that, that hit in the wall, the bonk. And, and here it was more of just the depletion to my core where, you know, I was like, oh, I can't, I can't, I'm stumbling on the sidewalk type of type of bonk. And so that by yourself, it takes a, quite a bit of, um, you know, self-talk and like, you got this and, you know, all this sort of self-motivation. Um, but so I was happy to kind of get off of that, and it was just a kind of a good reminder to uh, to not really take anything for granted, and there's no really gimme peaks. And um, another good example of that was when I got to uh, um, Democrat, and you do Democrat, Lincoln, Cameron. Those those peaks are all together in a little cluster. Relatively speaking, they're, they're really quite easy uh, 14ers, and you can get a lot of them in, in, in one, one go. And I got a foot of snow. Um, going up that peak in end of end of August, so the so end of point, August, a foot of snow. Nice. Yeah, so that was you know one of those those points where it's like okay, just don't don't take anything for for granted. Nothing's going to be really just given to you or easy, and particularly when your body's accumulated that much um, fatigue, um, you just don't really know necessarily how you're going to re respond on days. So I just tried to stay focused and be able to you know um, take things in stride. Well, you, you do you do mention bonking, and I do want to segue over to Chris Harrington and learn about uh, okay. front range cross country. Okay. That was kind of like a burn segue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can we can we hashtag that? You're, you're lucky. I'm I'm good minded about this thing. Okay, you're a good you're a good soul, Chris Harrington. Uh, Chris, introduce yourself to Dispatch Nation. We want to we want to learn a little bit about. We we've been seeing these T-shirts at like all these ultra marathons that we go to. We've been up to Bighorn, and we saw like seventy t-shirts with these. If you saw that, F then you might have been drinking a little too much, but there were a few. <laughs> Always, were a few. yeah. FRXC, what is this? What have you created here and why? Uh, so uh, FRXC stands for Front Range Cross Country, and what it is is uh, really a trail and ultra running group um, out here in Colorado. We obviously uh, have a number of them out here, um, but w w as you see more people kind of coming to trail and ultra running, um, it's an intimidating thing for someone new to the sport to experience. Uh, a lot of people are coming from road running or coming from backpacking um, or just new to running in general. So uh, we kind of made this thing to be this open, uh, very friendly uh, community where people could come and, and learn from some experienced runners and, and people going through their own struggles with, with different distances and, and not feel any pressure to have to perform to any certain standard. They could just come and run and, and have a good time. 
And so essentially, you, you so you have a you have a running group. We should mention this isn't your full time job. You also have a full time job. Yes, uh, I'm a real estate attorney uh, right. at a firm downtown Denver. Or well, we certainly didn't come here to talk about that. No, I'll tell no, you that. I left work to come talk about this. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. Um, and so you have weekly meetups where uh, people go out and run, and you also take groups out to different yeah. events. Yeah. So uh, every Wednesday we do kind of a group run. Um, Wednesday. Uh, usually six six thirty um, at Green Mountain over in Lakewood, and we alternate every other week. So I think um, this Wednesday will be a North Table Mountain, um, and that's kind of you know it's no drop run. We we all kind of stop at junctions, that type of thing, to make it feel very welcoming for people. So no one's just getting like blown out of the gate and feeling like they're dragging everything down. Because that's that's one knock on this community is uh, there there tends to be, and that's I mean honestly uh, among a team here, me, Lori, and Corey, I mean. When we created Dispatch Radio, that was part of uh, what drove us, was not not focusing so much on the elites and the sponsored athletes and being so mesmerized by all of that and making it you know, more approachable for the everyman. Well, hey, the sponsored athletes are impressive. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they're good. They're, they're impressive. I know, we, we care about Joe, yeah. and we care about Eric, too. Like, we have him on our podcast, but that's not all we're obsessed <laughs> I with. Know, right? I know. Well, uh, yes. And, and- and I was talking to Eileen because I've seen a lot of your events, but I'm a little intimidated. Like, am I going to come out and be the slowest runner and have you wait for me? And, and I, I think that's, uh, from talking to people, that seems to be everyone's kind of general concern is that they're going to be the slowest or whatever. Um, and and obviously in any group, someone will probably be the slowest, but we're not there to be like, oh, well, they're the slowest. We need to look down on them like they're lesser of a runner. No, you're out here doing it. And the fact of the matter is a lot of people aren't. And if you enjoy it, it shouldn't matter if you're the slowest or the fastest or where you are in the pack. You're out there just doing it to have a good time. Well, um, and speaking of uh, out there doing it to have a good time, Eileen Bloom, welcome. Uh, I, I'd like to introduce our audience to Eileen Bloom, the most recent addition to our Dispatch Radio blogging enterprise. Uh, welcome. You're also a member of Front Range Cross Country. Uh, we've met through Chris. Tell us a little bit about your background. My running background? Just tell us who you are. We, w- we want to get to know Eileen. Well, right now, I would say my current iteration is as a mother, lawyer, ultra runner. And I have tried to make a serious effort to, with all those um, things on my plate, I try to create a life where I can have some flexibility so I can spend time in a way that I value. So I also love to travel. So I've really learn to, you know, run to travel and travel to run. And it's been an amazing way to see new places. And so I knew Chris, and so I did start to go to the FRXC runs. And I can speak to what Lori was saying. My skill is definitely not speed. My skill is endurance, and I feel very comfortable at those events because there are a wide variety of people and a, a lot of options of different activities that they put on. And it's, it's been really great. And on the sort of, well, Chris hasn't talked about the uh, Mount Evans Triathlon yet. And after he does, I can speak to it a little bit. But it's inspired me to do my own self-propelled adventures Oh, we've, well. we've got to hear about this. What, uh, Chris, go ahead. Give us a uh, summary. Of what is this? First of all, what inspired so well, it was it was a number of things. It kind of it was an evolving idea, and I think that's how a lot of people kind of come to these. Um, initially, I, I live near City Park in Denver, and initially, um, you know, when I run around the park in the morning, that's my local jog. On a good morning, you've got the sun off the buildings in Denver, and then you've got Mount Evans just boom right in the background. So there and then, yeah, yeah, uh, and it, it it was kind of this thing where I said it'd be really awesome to run from right here in City Park in urban Denver to the top of Mount Evans. Um, and so that was the initial idea. And then actually it was uh, Eric and uh, Jason Anton did uh, an event called The Picnic. And I know this has been discussed on, on the podcast before, um, where they biked from Jackson Hole uh, to Jenny Lake, swam across Jenny Lake, and then climbed the Grand and did it all in reverse. Um, so I can only doggy paddle. And, <laughs> oh, uh, that's why the swim was so short. Well, I it was, get it. Yeah. And uh, I think the last time I rode a bike was when I was 16 or so. So after seeing that, I was like, well, the city running is going to be not fun anyway. So why don't we bike um, to a certain point and then uh, do something as a swim and then run the remainder of it? Uh, And one of the ideas, too, is how closely could we follow the Bear Creek drainage? Because that's kind of the water for Denver. So um, initially, we were going to want to start at Cherry Creek and maybe do the swim first. Um, 
there was some discussion about whether there was bacteria in the lake and whether we wanted to be itching ourselves the entire uh, rest of the trip. So what we did was um, I got off of work on a Friday night, um, probably about 5.30 or 6, got home. We biked uh, 28 miles from uh, City Park to Bear Creek Lake Park right before close, swam until like about 25 minutes before they were closing the park, and then ran uh, about 52 miles from Bear Creek Lake Park to the top of Mount Evans. Is, is everybody catching all this? I mean, are you, are you taking – Mama Harrington is, is a proud mama right now. She's oh, like, that's my boy. <laughs> Yeah, or an anxious mama. Anxious. <laughs> how, how, actually, we should pass the the mic oh, to no. mama. Okay. No, she doesn't want to. Mom says no. Yeah. No. Well, Eric, uh, I want I want to hear from. Did you? Did Did we finish the the stats? I'm sorry. Um, stat wise, I yeah, I think those are the stats. I have, and, yeah. and to what Joe was talking about earlier about it being you know the time not being as important. Honestly, sitting here, I couldn't tell you how long it took us. It was about kind of just. All right, there we go. I yeah. like that. I like that. And that's I'm the only that's, one though. <laughs> that, that event, that's what makes it fun. Is I, I was with a couple of good friends uh, with Mark Mars, and this was Mark Marsden's 30th birthday party. Um, so with Mark and another guy Barrett, um, who were the we were the three that kind of started FRXC. Um, we did that, and then a guy named Peter Nielsen and uh, Tony Monreal did the run. Tony, from, part uh, of our dispatch crew. Yeah, from Evergreen to the top from there. So uh, yeah, and we did it overnight. So it was uh, it was it was awesome. It was Eileen, awesome. Eileen you, it sounds like you were inspired by that. Well, I was going to be out of town when that was taking place, traveling in Greece with my family, and I was kind of upset that I wouldn't be able to participate. I thought I could keep up on the bike at least. So I had decided that I was going to run my own marathon distance while I was in Greece as sort of a complimentary uh, FRXC international chapter. Nice. <laughs> and then also since that uh, point in time, that sort of helped me understand that I could um, get to the next level and, and do a 50-mile run by myself. Awesome. Well, and, and Eric Sanders, you just inspired the uh, Mount Evans Triathlon. How do you feel about that? Um, yeah, I mean, it feels good to uh, inspire other people to do things. It sounds like Chris Hardy kind of had an, an idea of that. But, um, you know, just getting out in the mountains and having fun, I think, is, is kind of what it's all about. And, uh, you know, whether you're, you're the fastest or you're, you're you know, you're just out there just pushing yourself, that's all, that's all it's about, you know. That's all I'm trying to do. I think that's all uh, Joe's trying to do. We're just out here pushing our pushing our own limits and, as you as you grow through you know endurance sports and maybe the outdoors you you kind of uh get to a point and then you kind of want to push yourself a little further and then it, it just kind of grows and like you know that was no one's for me it was it was my way of trying to push myself you know push my limits of what I know is possible like um you know I know I can do a couple 14ers in a day and uh you know before you know no one's is a is a is an effort that I didn't know if I could finish. And, you know, obviously I, I kind of finished, you know, I was about halfway through it and I reached, I reached my, uh, my point of where I was felt tested and like, you know, I was out there to test myself and I, I definitely found, found that, that point. And, you know, that's what we're all out there to do is to test ourselves and to have fun out in the mountains. And, um, yeah, that, that leads to a question that I have, which is, sort of the next level of why. So we have the, oh, I did this, I want to do that thing next. And not just the, oh, it's fun to plan stuff and get a bunch of maps out. The why, when you're telling yourself why you're doing it, two-thirds of the way in or halfway in or where things are going bad. For, for you and, you know, whatever that might be, whether it's you trying your, each of us try our next hardest adventure. What's the, what's the next level of why for you? I have an answer. <laughs> and I'm curious to, all, to know... Yeah. Um, what everybody else thinks about this as well. But for me, I think it really creates a certain level of freedom that I can't experience in other ways. And so even when, you know, you're out there doing something incredibly difficult, it still represents this level of freedom for me, freedom via Mother Nature. I think for me it's just curiosity, you know, the, the discovering uh, new places and, and, and ways that I, I sort of react to to those environments and, and, and different ways that I'm feeling. And I, I don't necessarily think that it's um, fun. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's like a, a, a reason for me at least to, to go and do something. Like there's aspects of it that are going to be fun. And then there are a lot of aspects that are going to be um, 
you know, really challenging. And those are opportunities to learn and grow. And um, I think that's that's kind of what makes it um, maybe a little bit deeper and and you know uh, more worthwhile and fulfilling for me. For me, it's it's on the other end of the spectrum. I I have kind of two personalities where, you know, and Eileen and I talk about this, but. You know, day job is sitting in a building at a desk, at a chair, looking at rules. And I hear you, at, brother. Yeah, there you go. Um, and that's it's pretty rigid. And there's a freedom with being outside, whether it's on a trail or just off, you know, on whatever terrain. Freedom of movement or freedom of choosing what you want to do in that moment and, and picking big, intimidating objectives. Um, and there's a lot of freedom in that. And I think that for everyone, that's, that's a really important um, feature of kind of outdoor adventuring generally that that can be overlooked sometimes. Eric Sanders, world class adventure racer. Um, yeah, it's a lot about exploration for me. I mean, yeah, exploring new places. As far as adventure racing goes, like the reason that part of the reason that keeps me me you know going back to it is just being able to explore a new place is is pretty amazing. And and while you know we do explore a place in a pretty unique way. You know, we're pushing pretty hard and fast through these places and, you know, we're sleep deprived and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, we still get to experience the place and, and we experience it in a pretty unique way, uh, day and night. Um, you know, uh, and I don't think I, as far as for me, I don't really think I would remember it necessarily. Like this is kind of maybe a tangent of mine, but I don't think I would remember it any better necessarily if I was, completely awake and sleeping, you know, eight hours a day, I don't think I would take it in any more than I would as I'm out there. Um, but yeah, I, I love pushing my limits and just seeing, seeing what the human body can accomplish. And, and if that's my, maybe my own body, like I don't, maybe somebody else has done it, you know, 15 hours faster than me. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter uh, what anybody else has done. Like I'm trying to push myself out there and, uh, you know, experience the place and, I feel like that's that's all that matters. On that note, what's uh, what's up next? What's the next test for each one of you? Yeah, what's coming up? What's next? Joe's like, is that not enough? Did you not hear me? <laughs> like, I'm done for a decade. No way. <laughs> Eric, what's next for you? Um, I'm going to be going to Australia in November for the Ad Adventure Racing World Championships. Oh, um, nice. I'm racing with uh, Adventure Medical Kids, so... Um, are you, are you breaking news right now? Uh, a little bit. But, All right. Uh, so yeah, Eric mean, Sanders, the golden talent here, has just told us that he's racing for the world championships and adventure racing with definitely one of the top teams in the on the on the planet. Um, yeah, adventure medical kids. They're ranked uh, third in the world. Um, in the world. You know, whatever that means. Wait, what are the but, names uh, of your teammates? Because I bet they're hilarious. <laughs> it means they're pretty good. And uh, Kyle Peter, he lives in San Francisco. Uh, he's he's been at the top of the adventure racing circuit in the U.S. for I don't even know how long, a long time. Um, Mary Chandler, she's arguably you know one of the best uh, female adventure racers in the world, if not um, the U.S. You know she's a professional mountain biker uh, at the you know 24 hour um, length. Like she, yeah, just one of the best adventure racing uh, females in the world. Uh, and then this guy, Rob Preston, he's actually from Australia, and he's one of the best navigators in the world uh, as far as adventure racing goes. So wow. I know that, you know, adventure racing is kind of like uh, a niche. It's a really niche sport. Well, we're, gonna, we're making it huge on Dispatch Radio. We're pumping you up, baby. <laughs> I appreciate that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, Joe, what's next for you? I actually just kind of... Retirement. <laughs> yeah. God, I'd be so tired if I... I would just sleep for 10, 10 years. Well, the, the interesting thing is uh, physically and, and mentally, I, was, I, was, I didn't come out really burnt um, from being in the mountains. It was more just a reintroduction into, you know, the real world. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, I've spent a, spent a few days here and there in the mountains, and you come back when you're by yourself for so long, you're especially, like, and you're just like, what is all of this coming at me? I can only imagine... A, a month? That, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, taking a month off is a, is a you know a big kind of privilege and and, and something that um, I, I was really fortunate to be able to do. And at the same time, it is um, 
there's quite a lot of strain, you know, involved with that, just kind of preparing for it, taking the time off, and then coming back and, and, and getting back in the, in, the, in the groove and the flow of things. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not burnt at all. I just feel that I need to uh, fully kind of absorb um, this trip, and I want to do some writing about it. We're, I'm working on a, on a film, too. And, and so those, those are things that I don't just want to, you know, kind of move on to the next thing immediately. Wait, are you friends with Dr. Ski? Dr. Ski. John yeah. Kudrowski, our, uh, our new best bud? You I don't know. know. Oh, and we got to get you connected <laughs> with Dr. John. He's, awesome. he's a PR machine when it comes to the outdoor life. Uh, yeah, that, that is a serious part of what you do is, is to support what you do. You've got to build interest. Uh, and that's one of the topics we're not going to get time tonight to talk about. But we'd love to come back is just uh, like you mentioned earlier, you, it, it sounds like you're, you're not driven by the time and the, you know, beating the time and the fast snow time and all that. Uh, but in reality, that is how you get attention, and that's how you build a story um, to build a narrative around what you're doing to get more people interested and as well as to support, you know, what you're doing. Is that part of it? Somewhat, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think there's, the, yeah, the story component is, is really important in, in kind of thinking about how to, to share the experience. And you can, you know, you can have something that's that's not time-related at all if it's a really good story. And that, you know, is, so I, I try to, you know, if you drop out of a race, for instance, it's not because you didn't finish the race that your story getting there or actually in the event isn't interesting, you know, and isn't worthwhile and isn't worth sharing. So, um, yeah, trying to think about those aspects and, and everything else that goes on during the trip um, is, is really important. So I'll, I'll start to think of the, the next year's calendar and probably in, in the next couple months. But um, for now, I just kind of want to work on, 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 you know, getting everything kind of put together around this trip. Dr. John, if you're listening, we're going to get you connected to Joe Grant. We're going to give him a, a nice primer in, in PR. And, and, and you said you're filming a movie. Was there a film? Was there a camera crew with you? or? No, I filmed everything myself. I'm actually work, working with um, a guy named Dean Leslie from South Africa. He's um, he is an independent movie maker in, for Wandering Fever. Um, he he's, he's makes all the, uh, the Solomon films right now. Um, so you probably know him uh, through that. Um, so he's a really great guy and, and we're just kind of on the same page around that so it's going to be a pretty raw in the way so you were out there with an iphone doing selfie videos uh i took a little point and shoot sony camera and a gopro and uh so there's going to be a, a mix of you know the gopro is more for the, the action sort of you know running along ridges and that kind of stuff and then the the, the sort of intimate journaling was more on the on the sony so yeah, we'll see. I, I do I do more stills, so the the whole film thing is, is a little bit new to me. So that was kind of a there's going to be a lot of shaky camera and and, and you know not great sort of filming, <laughs> but hopefully we can build a, a good story around it and um, and share it with people. How, how much footage would you say you took? Quite a bit. Yeah, I think like, we have a terabyte or something uh, worth of. That footage. sounds like a lot of footage, but whatever that means, you know, <laughs> right. it, it, it's, I think it's a lot. Um, I mean, it's, a, I think it's a decent amount to make a, you know, somewhere around a short film, 20, 25 minutes. Um, it's probably, probably what we're looking at. Awesome. Eileen, what's next for you? I am traveling to Arizona Halloween weekend to conquer my first hundred K and I'm looking All forward right. to living in those moments. Good luck, Eileen. That's Thank exciting. You. So, wait, Eileen, just to clarify for our audience, wh when did you start ultra running? About two years ago. And now you're doing your first 100. All right. Inspiration. Pass it on. And Chris, we didn't actually, we didn't go over your run, rabbit, run. Uh, I'd, I'd prefer not Would you to. prefer to just skip? Okay. Yeah. Well, well, how we can about talk a, about a DNFs summary? later. We can talk about right. DNFs later. What's then. next yeah, for you, we'll Chris? do a DNF episode. Because um, you're an amazing man. You're, uh, we, should, we didn't even mention you're a, an outstanding runner yourself. Uh, are you still sponsored by Merrill? Yeah, I'm All a right. brand ambassador Good. for Merrill. So. Brand ambassador Even though I have a DNF, they're still giving me shoes. <laughs> well, it's I'm like still I, didn't, I wasn't meaning to infer. Now that Listen, you have a DNF okay. under your belt, do they still sponsor <laughs> you? Well, like Joe said, so sensitive. There's, a, there's a story in there. I mean, every there race is. has a story. Yeah. yeah. What is the story? story just give us the, the, the takeaway. No, not the story. Just give us the takeaway. What did you learn from a DNF? I... I I pushed myself pretty hard. I, I was sick going into the race. Um... And I don't think I gave that enough um, 
enough seriousness uh, and thought I could still hit a very aggressive time goal even though I was sick. And I was, I was racing as a hare, um, and my mindset was different than my previous races where I was racing for fun. This time I had a time goal, and just getting through the race wasn't something that I was mentally accepting. So and you, I you stepped get it, it up head. a notch on the kind of competitive notch. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I mean, it's a pretty safe environment to do that cons- I mean, compared to a lot of things. I mean, you know, compared to Nolan's and biking by yourself around, it's, you know, there are aid stations, that type of thing. So I could push myself a little bit harder and try and try and really get out of my comfort zone. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't, you know, wasn't my, wasn't my day. So, yeah. All right. Well, you, you didn't have your day. What's next for Chris Harrington? Um, I'm kind of coming down off the backside of that. I'll probably run, run rabbit again next year, but, um, in the, in the fun kind of ideas, uh, I don't know if you're hearing this first, but, uh, circumnavigations of the pack Northwest volcanoes with climbs of certain routes on them. Oh. Um, it's something that I've been looking at for a couple of years and I've been working on my climbing skills a little bit more. Um, but I, I mean, I think Mount Hood, Mount Adams, Mount Rainier all have trails that, uh, circumnavigate the mountains and there are obviously various different routes you can, you can climb those, uh, mountains by. So, uh, that's something I've been looking at for a while and I might, you know, this year, next year, I might try and put something together to do something out there. Joe, Joe, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I feel like a lot of, uh, and then we're going to open it up to the audience, uh, for your questions. So if you've got questions for Joe Grant or any of our, uh, guess we're going to open it up in a minute, but Judge, what are your thoughts? I mean, part of our purpose of bringing this panel together was, you know, to have these kind of interesting conversations where, you know, we're not just talking to the sponsored athletes that can just, you know, get out there. I don't even understand how you do what you do. I mean, I've read up on you and I, I, I you don't seem human to me. Um, but does it feel good to know that, you know, people are following you and, and feeling inspired by the types of things that you're doing and that that seems to be, um, kind of leaving a trace in people's minds. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I just, um, I think what I learned from, from this 14 er trip is that actually that, um, it's not that extraordinary. I mean, it might seem at the end, like you've got this, you know, big accomplishment and such, but there's, uh, there were really big lows during the trip. And there's a lot of, like you, you there's a lot of kind of, I don't know, humility that comes out of it. You just can't push yourself, um, you know, day after day after day, um, without sort of that, that, um, uh, like pacing yourself and thinking, you know, more long term. So for me, at least in my running career, it's been a lot of, um, stepping stones, you know, just kind of building up gradually, um, over, over the distances. And, and, and this challenge for me was, uh, um, hard enough, but not so hard that it was, um, impossible for me to do. And so I think that that was a, a pretty nice, you know, a nice step. Um, I think if I tried this, um, I don't know, four or five years ago, I probably wouldn't have been ready, um, to do it. Um, at least not in this way. So I think there's, yeah, you, you learn gradually over time that, um, you know, how much further you can kind of, kind of push yourself. But to what Chris is, is wanting to do, I, I actually lived in, in the Pacific Northwest for three years. And, oh, I can um, give you some intel. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because it's a project that I've thought about a lot. I think it, they're all... <laughs> no, Serendipity they're all, they're on really Dispatch cool, Radio. They're just really cool mountains, and, and, and there's a really special special um, you know environment up there, and the volcanoes are just, uh, um, yeah, amazing. So there's, that's, I think, a, a really inspiring project, and uh, I hope you, you, know, you take it up. <laughs> it's really good. Lori, uh, I know you spent some time with Eric Lee. You, you know this world a lot. Any closing remarks? Any closing thoughts? Yeah, it's great to hear from just the variety, the range, and be inspired and uh, hear about the highs and lows that, you know, we all experience. So thanks for bringing us together. So with that, we're going to open it up to the audience. Before we do that, I want to introduce everybody to one person. So while you all are thinking of the questions that you have for Joe Grant or any of our audience members, Bix, I want to bring you on here. Um, can everybody, I, I mentioned this at the top of the show, Big City Mountaineers, a really great program, a nonprofit here, uh, based in, in Denver. They've got their, uh, their global headquarters here in Golden, uh, Colorado. Bix, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on. Uh, we originally were going to be recording from the global headquarters of Big City Mountaineers, but if our Facebook live stream would just kind of rotate to the audience... 
and show why we couldn't. We couldn't fit all these people in their in their shop. So uh, we thank Mountain Toad Brewing for having us uh, for our expanded live audience. It's been great to have everybody here, and we look forward to hearing your questions. If I haven't uh, sparked that thought enough in your heads, Bix, tell us a little bit about what Big Big City Mountaineering does. Ma- sure, Mountaineers, so, excuse me. Uh, Big City Mountaineers has been around for about 26 years, uh, and we run transformative wilderness mentoring trip for underserved youth. Um, all of our trips partner with youth development organizations that work in the city, um, are a part of their, our students' lives all year round, um, and we take them into the backcountry for a week with a one adult to one student ratio. Um, to allow them to have the sort of transformative experiences everyone up here uh, has been talking about. And, and Bix, what, uh, what's your connection with the program? How did you get involved? Sure. Uh, I've been with Big City Mountaineers for five years, actually. I uh, started as an instructor, um, and now I'm the Colorado program manager. So I'm in charge of uh, all the trips that leave out of our Colorado offices, volunteer recruitment, um, and interaction with the public to get people excited about our programs. A little awkward for Bix because he doesn't have headphones like the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. <Sorry. laughs> and, oh, that probably won't stretch. So. <laughs> yeah, don't. Worry. Can and and person. can you just tell our listeners if people want to get involved, learn more about you, uh, what's the best thing to do? Sure. Um, going to bigcitymountaineers.org. Um, we require hundreds of volunteers this summer uh, who are willing to spend a week in the woods with some awesome, awesome youth. Um, also, if hanging out with kids isn't your, your cup of tea, we have our Summit for Someone program where people get to go and climb peaks they've always wanted to climb to raise money so our students can go and get on top of the peaks that we take them to. I can, I can vouch for that. I did that a couple years ago in oh, uh, the Tetons. T-tons. Yeah. We Very actually nice. got snowed out, but we climbed uh, Baxter's Pinnacle up there, awesome. which was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life because I'm a Gumby on rock. But it was a great <laughs> program, and I was really happy to well, take part in it. And, and another Front Range Cross Country member is also uh, a volunteer with your organization, Nick Lick. Yeah, Nick Lick, that's right. Like. Yeah. Oh, Nick Like. Thank I know. you. I yeah, know it's spelling. been a mystery with the dispatch. We've all been wondering, how do you pronounce this guy's last name? You didn't or, ask him. Or any how do you pronounce name for it? that matter. How do you spell, spell it? How do you pronounce Lord's name? Is it name? L-E-U-C-K? Hey, if I get L-E-U-C-K. someone's name right, yeah. forget the pronunciation of it. Yeah, anyway. Sorry. We digress. But he was out there for a week. Um, yeah, he had nothing but good things to say about his experience out there, too. Yeah, yeah I think really enjoyed it. Often just as life changing for the adults uh, as it is for our students. I know it was for me. Um, every trip I instruct, I come back a much better and more self reflective person. So, what's so, the age of your of your youth? Uh, most of our students we take out backpacking are between thirteen and eighteen. Uh, here in Colorado, we also run a summer camp for eight to twelve year olds uh, up in Genesee. And folks more interested in Big City Mountaineers, uh, we're going to be releasing a little segment we did. Uh, well, we did two segments during the Ghost Society Adventure Fest. We did one with uh, one of your program directors, and then we did one with three actual alumni ambassadors. And we're going to be coming back to your headquarters pretty soon here uh, to do a full show on you. So, Bix, thanks for coming out. Thanks, thanks for having a lot. Me. And with that, we're going to open it up. Who wants to be our brave first? Qu- it's always the first question. Then. And then as soon as the first question starts, we, we start rolling. Jen? Oh, we've got, a, we've got a Facebook question. Hold on. <laughs> Eric Sanders, Eric's first question. question. Eric's got an yeah. audience guest question. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, you can ask yeah, it now. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to ask a question to Joe, but um, so I know you kind of, you know, you need some time to rest and all that, but I was wondering what you think about Uli Steck's uh, 82 Summits project, like if you have any kind of resonance with that or if you're, you know, it's really early probably to, for you to say, but if you'd ever be interested in trying something like that, since it's, you know, exactly along the same lines as is the 14ers, uh, Tour to 14ers. Yeah, I actually saw Uli uh, talk the other night. He was in in Boulder. Yeah, he was uh, he was talking in Boulder, so did a did a quite a lengthy presentation about about that trip. I mean, one of the big distinctions is that the Alps are a lot more technical. Um, you know, the 14ers are just piles of rocks, <laughs> and and so the, there's a, a technical component to uh, what Uli did that is um, you know quite a bit different, in, in, and certainly in the you know, in the style and biking between the peaks, it's similar. And um, I've, 
yeah, I've been fortunate to go to the, I grew up in France, and so I've been to the, to the Alps, I think, the past six or seven years, and uh, absolutely love, love the train out there, and um, just a, some really amazing mountains. So yeah, it's a, I think it's a really inspiring, cool project, um, but I probably need to, to brush up a little bit on my, my technical climbing skills to be able to take on something like that. I, I believe Jen has a question from a Facebook tuner in her. Um, so Steve Brimmer has a question for Joe. What was your low point on your journey, and did you almost ever quit? So as I yeah I mentioned before, uh, the low point was definitely I think Mount Ontario for me. Um, there were a couple couple rough spots. The um, there was frustra frustration around uh, trying to make it to to Culebra on time, and just kind of the stress around that. Um, and then I got some really rough weather through the San Juan. So as much of the San Juans are um, phenomenal range, there was definitely um, it was quite challenging and quite stressful mentally to deal with with the monsoons and uh, and a lot of sun thunderstorms. And um, but the low point was definitely on Antero for me, just in terms of physical, um, mental low point. I think was randomly actually was on Mount Elbert. I, I'm not entirely sure why, but I just, I think it was just accumulation of everything. I got to the top and just started bawling my eyes out and, uh, <laughs> had about 15 minutes of feeling sorry for myself and not, not, yeah, just, just, just struggling a little bit. But, um, I never, I never really, um, thought of quitting, um, other than if I got seriously injured or got the bike stolen or broken or something like that, that would have been a, a reason to, to stop. But because I didn't have after Culebra really a time constraint, um, I mean, to some extent I did, just I can't be out there for, for months and months. But there was there was a, a little bit less pressure on that front. So, yeah, it was it – was, I was hoping that nothing – like my bike wouldn't get stolen or I, I wouldn't break somehow. Um, so thankfully that didn't happen. We're just going to take a quick pause while we uh, figure out the best audience. Mike, sorry. Just have him come over here. All right. Audience members – Step right up with a question. So, Joe, oh, my, my name's Don. Uh, I'm training for my first 5K. Where do you live? And you guys are just inspiring me. Where do you live? Kidding. I'm a native, Lakewood, Colorado. Yeah, just turned 51. Hey, Joe, uh, what was the longest commute on the bike, peak to peak? Peak to peak was probably about a... It was probably that from Lake City to Antero, so about 110 miles. Um, there was uh, that was yeah, that was probably the longest segment, and it just the the clusters kind of work out pretty well to where you know you you, you kind of get to the San Juans, and there is about 250 miles of riding in there, um, but a lot of them are, are broken up by by different peaks. So actually, getting to um, the San Juan uh, from the San Juans to the Sawatch was probably one of the, the longest segments of, of straight riding. Okay, second question: What kind of bike? <laughs> yeah, I rode a Reeb uh, Reeb out of Longmont um, Hardtail Mountain Bike, and uh, I debated a lot before the the trip as to whether or not I should go with a you know a cross bike, a, a rigid mountain bike. Um, and I settled for, uh, I had a little um, tendonitis in, in my wrist from a, a previous trip I did this year. Um, and so I, I figured that, that the shock would actually be pretty nice to, uh, to, to help with that. Um, the microphones, is, is that still working? Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I settled for a hardtail mountain bike. And, and, and I think overall, it was actually a really good choice. I, probably about a, a third of it was paved. A, a third was uh, on dirt roads. And then another third was um, pretty, pretty rough, um, or at least like, you know, warranted a, a, a mountain bike shock. So, so I, I was I was happy. I mean, the bike's super comfortable, and obviously you're a little bit slower on on road portions. But um, yeah, I loved it, and and also kind of connected to the local aspect of um, it's hand built here in uh, in Longmont, and uh, the Reap guys were, were really great in supporting my trip, and so I'm super thankful for them, and I'm just kind of psyched to to be able to to tie that into the trip in, in more ways than just having a, a rad bike. All right. Well, thank you for your question. And uh, Facebook Live viewers, uh, I know it's getting dark. Uh, we promise our panelists are still there. So feel free to tune in with your questions. We've got a question here from the audience. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Sarah from Boulder. Um, my question is for Eric. I'm looking to get into adventure racing, and I just kind of want to know what's your best advice for a beginner adventure racer. Well, your your answer better start with tune in to the <laughs> Dispatch better. Radio Choose we'll, Your Own we'll Adventure episode, all right? Exactly. All right. Yep. What after that? So after yeah, turn, tuning into the uh, Choose Your Own Adventure podcast. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there was a number of um, adventure races here locally in Colorado actually this year, which was pretty cool. Um, Journey Racing hosted those. Um, the uh, Nomad uh, down in Buena Vista area um, was in June, and then there was a 24-hour race uh, in Grand Lake actually um, in uh, first week of August. Um, so I'd try to look into some uh, just some shorter races from you know, anywhere from six hours to 24 hours. Uh, don't be discouraged by the 24 hour mark. You know, you can push yourself, um, you know, a lot farther than you think. And, and it's all kind of at your own, at your own pace in an adventure race and, uh, um, brush up on, I guess your number one probably key thing is just to maybe focus on a little bit of navigation, kind of brush up on your nav navigation skills, um, like, so you don't spend two hours walking around looking for one checkpoint you that's a hundred yards <laughs> away from you. <laughs> ask exactly. Corey how to get into it. He's got yeah. some great experience. We can tell you how not to do the navigation. Yeah, we convinced a couple of these guys to do their first adventure race in uh, Grand Lake a couple months ago. Um, so that was a good time. Um, but yeah, make sure you got the gear. Mountain bike is probably your biggest expense. Um, get, get, uh, proficient in that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, just go for it. Um, for sure. And I don't, don't know if it's true of all of the adventure races. Never yeah. Summer seemed like they did a good job with their introductory six-hour race, which had, like, how to get better at orienteering or, like, you know, you could kind of test the waters without committing to 24 or 36 or 72 or however many crazy hours you guys do it for. They'll do that race next year also. Cool. And, and yes, if, if you're interested in this phenomenon called uh, venture racing, we did do an entire episode dedicated to it. We did commit to doing some adventure racing. We did set adventure racing, and we've got an episode coming out pretty soon where we recap uh, what happened in said adventure race. So definitely check out some of our past episodes. We've got another audience question. Hi, I'm Emma, and I live here in Golden. My question is for Eileen. I'm curious how your family reacted when you first said you wanted to train for an ultra marathon. <laughs> Great question. I think that this definitely falls in the category of did not see this one coming. <laughs> um, but they've been entirely supportive and excited about it. I try my hardest to get my training in as to not affect everybody else. It's amazing what you can accomplish before everybody else in the house wakes up. And then you still have the entire day ahead of you. But it's been so far so good. I think they were more excited to be at the races at the beginning than they are now because it's a lot of uh, commitment uh, because it could be a long period of time that varies at each race when they're waiting. Um, but I've been lucky with the support. Is that true for the rest of you guys as well? I'm curious what your uh, either significant other family, you know, distant aunt and uncle yeah let's run through it so eric you don't have family <laughs> <laughs> eric's a robot well you have parents but you don't have kids right you're not tied <laughs> down no i don't have any <laughs> he's not tied down he can do whatever he wants yeah i'm, I'm single uh, but, uh <laughs> oh <laughs> no um like... yeah you got uh by the way no... eric has groupies by the way guys no, if you go if you got seriously groupies. we were out at the never summer adventure <laughs> race uh and he did he had groupies uh at the race uh joe what's your family situation I'm, I'm married, um, and I don't have any kids. Um, yeah, I think it's evolved over time. And at, at first, it was uh, maybe a little bit challenging, and uh, there's definitely ups and downs depending on how long I'm gone or, or how sort of intense I can, you know, get about out, about the trip. But I think we've both learned to, to, to manage it and, and um, uh, try to I, – I think at first we'd kind of try to – create vacations around some of the races and that doesn't really work. I try well. to do that too. It, it doesn't really work. It's yeah. sort of a nice idea, but then it just, it just, 
everything. Not to compare my adventures to yours, but yeah. I've <laughs> no, but that. then everything's focused, you know, on the event and the race, and then and then you're kind of destroyed at the end and can't really. So it's just not really a good a good mix. So I think trying to um, separate those things, and uh, but my wife supports me um, a lot, and sh- and she'll come to uh, to races and crew and 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 hang out. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a it's a positive positive thing right now. And Eileen, I think we covered off on you. You've got two kids, boy and girl. What are the ages? Remind us. My son is eight. My daughter is six. Eight and six with a full-time lawyer gig. It's, yeah, if you're uh, making excuses for not being able to do an ultra, might need to reevaluate. And Chris, you're, you're, you're fairly unhinged. No kids. No, no kids. No wife. Girl, girlfriend, no kids. Girlfriend, no kids. Um, G-F-N-K. Yeah, okay. she runs Hashtag. a little bit, too, so that makes that easy. And she runs. Weekends. Yeah. She runs as well. She's And she's yeah, here. She's hiding over there. Yeah. She's embarrassed. She's hiding next to Mama Harrington. Yeah. That's right. I know. It's, it's good. It's great. We have another question from the audience. Thanks. Uh, I'm Lauren, also from Boulder. Um, I think a general question for everyone is, what do you eat? Um, and how much of it are you carrying? And I don't know, I'm sure that's been kind of a journey for all of you, but if you could speak to a little bit of it, that would be super helpful. Pierogies. All right, nutrition. Pierogies. <laughs> Pierogies. Eric Sanders, what's your uh, go-to trail food? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the duration and, and um, you know, what I'm trying to do. For a multi-day adventure race, you have to carry all of your food, right? It, it really varies based on, you know, in a multi-day adventure race, you have bins that you pre-pack before the race, and those... Uh, bins are packed based on you know the this course uh, logistic thing that they give you and it and it has a time estimate a fast and a slow estimate so it could be anywhere from from six hours of food to to you know 48 hours of food um, that we're carrying at a time um, but uh, my go-to foods is just real uh, you know snicker bars I like to do some some real foods you know uh, peach cups like uh one thing i really like to do in uh really hot races adventure races are like pickle cups like these little dill pickle i mean they're uh, freaking amazing juice. yeah juice i is mean the best. they're <laughs> it's so good um, is it the salt the salt and yeah. yeah the vinegar i mean i don't know what it is but they're super good um what else do i like i don't know some kind of beef jerky some kind of like Beef sticks, stuff like that. Beef sticks and peaches. All right, Joe. <laughs> what what do you, what do you carry on the trail? Yeah, it depends on the the distance, the event. Um, you, also, I'm I'm guessing you just catch your own food. You don't bring any food. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the 14ers, it was uh, it was not an exemplary diet. Um, <laughs> it was every anything anything goes. I really just I didn't I didn't bring a stove, and so a lot of times I was I was in. Uh, in places late late at night to resupply, it has to be portable. So I actually ate a lot of um, frozen burritos that I would stash in the bike and let thaw out um, on the ride. Um, and uh, Wait, are you saying you li- you just ate a frozen burrito? No, no, no. So you buy you buy the burrito at a gas station, bean and cheese burrito, um, put it in the in the saddle, uh, you know, in the frame bag of the bike. And, I uh, bet nobody had that image of Joe Grant, <laughs> that he was stopping in at the 7-Eleven, There was a lot $2 of $2 burrito that none of us will eat. I, I read I, that and to you, and it was delicious. you had handmade them. Yeah, no, I eat, a, I eat a pretty wholesome diet usually, and I think that here it was just a matter of uh, getting in enough calories and, and basically eating, you know, whatever I could. So there was a kind of a hiatus during the trip as to um, not, not a whole lot of health food. Um, but yeah, it depends on the race. You know, if it's a shorter distance race, it's going to be more more liquids, um, sort of uh, easier to to absorb. Um, so a hundred mile race, um, I, I like the kind of rice cakes, um, rice puddingy kind of stuff that that works pretty well. Um, and I also use uh, just like a, a drink as well, Tailwind, um, which which works well for me. So it just it just a matter of the the distance, portability, if I'm going to have crew or not. Um, and yeah, certainly on the on the bike, I can eat a lot more. Um, running is a little bit more sensitive because you have the jostling of, of your stomach, and um, so I have to be a little bit more dialed um, with uh, with what I eat running. Um, but biking, I can kind of do whatever. And, and yeah, so. Eileen, do you have any favorite trail food? I'm I'm picturing you picturing aid stations that you've been through with delicious Oreo cookies. I definitely go for the junk food, but I'm trying to get away from that. 
And it's hard for me because I'm a vegetarian, so I have to think a lot about this. And I've, I'm really refining my nutrition plan. But when I did my solo 50 miler, I ran the entire time with this breakfast burrito in my backpack. And that was amazing. And it made me laugh. So I think that I'm going to go with that next time, too. <laughs> you might want to get sponsored Wait, you just, by it. You just ran with no, the no. buck. You didn't actually I ate eat it. it. I ate you just it. Ran Every with time it. I took it out, I laughed and then I ate a lot of it. <laughs> Eileen has a good time out there on the trail, if you haven't noticed. Chris? Um, I jokingly refer to myself as a hashtag pizza-based athlete. Um, I know a lot of people kind of stick to, like, plants and stuff, but, yeah, I, I eat a ton of pizza. I, I ate an entire pizza, a pizza hut in Fair Play um, the night before a 50-miler out there and then pretty much just drank water all day and had a pretty good finish, I guess, all things considered. <laughs> nice. So um, The no, pizza athlete. Yeah, I... Uh, I see I a drink, sponsorship in your future. You know, well, the pizza, pizza hut in Fairplay went out of business, call so, unfortunately. <laughs> um, tailwind, when I'm out there, I, I tend to go for that. And then uh, uh, pierogies are really easy for me to digest, and I really like the pasta and potato combo, so that seems to work pretty well, too. Aid station captains, make note. Pierogies right. at aid stations. That's right. Piro- yeah, no, I think the Rocky Mountain Runners actually had pierogies at the Dirty 30. Dirty 30 and Hard nice. Rock. Yeah. Hard Rock has them. No Way one to said go, bacon. Rocky Mountain Runners. No one said bacon. I'm shocked. Bacon. Yeah, there was, bacon, bacon was not mentioned, but I think we can all agree, other than Eileen, the vegetarian, who, drink, who eats tofu bacon. I'm actually a closet bacon eater at the races. <laughs> bacon wrap dates at your aid station. Well, thank you, everybody, for showing up. It's been great. Uh, Eric Sanders, world-class adventure racer. Trademark that. Joe Grant, (laughs) adventurer, uh, inspirer of all people who like to self-propel. Eileen Bloom, an inspiration to all of us, really. uh, The the every woman, if you will, of the panel. And Chris Harrington, uh, who has... We didn't get a whole lot into it, but his running group has is, is gotten really popular really fast. He's doing something a little different, a little special. Uh, Chris, we didn't uh, let people know how to find you. Uh, if they want to check out what's going on with Front Range Cross Country, how do they do that? Yeah, we've got a, a website at frxc.org. Um, frxc.org. frxc.org. Uh, and you can look up uh, Front Range Cross Country on Facebook. But and, the logo is um, a goat wearing sunglasses so you know it's pretty laid back. Oh, shout out to uh, Ligature, Jeff Paul. Ligature Creative, Jeff Paul, for yeah, coming up with Jeff the logo. Jeff Paul, you're an amazing man. Yeah, he is designer amazing of man. the Front Range Cross Country we logo. We should bring Eileen back for the episode about community that we're going to uh, record at Skirt well, Sports October yeah. 11th. You've, so. you've just been enlisted. And Joe, how do people uh, follow you? What, what, what's the best method for folks to follow you and learn more about you? Yeah, my website's uh, alpine-works.com. And uh, uh, pretty much all my handles on Instagram, Twitter, and such, uh, Alpine Works. So, and, and we didn't touch on Alpine Works much. Will you just give us a, uh, w- what is that? It's just sort of my platform to be able to, um, you know, promote my, my work and what I do. So uh, the blog, I, I, I coach some runners. And, um, yeah, so just basically a landing page for, for me to be able to, to, yeah, promote what I do. So not only are you inspiring people, kind of chronicling your own adventures and trying to inspire people to get out there, but you're also working with some folks to help them achieve their own goals out in the outdoors? Yeah, exactly. Right on. And Eric, how do we find you? How do we track you? What's the best, best method other than uh, all the uh, groupies that I met at Never Summer? <laughs> um, yeah, just, you know, social media platforms. I'm not, you know... Technically, a legitimate. that. We're going to get a little, a little you know, session sponsored with you, athlete or anything. But, Dr. Uh, John, Dr. Ski up in Vail, and uh, <laughs> Joe Grant, and we're just going to have a little PR sesh on yeah. uh, outdoors because we do. We want to get adventure racing back on TV. That's one of Dispatch Radio's top okay. ten goals for the year. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd like to see <laughs> right, it, <Corey>? um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you can. I'm on. You know, I'm kind of in the middle of two teams right now. Uh, but yeah, I'd go. Follow uh, Team Yoga Slackers. Um, find them on Facebook, uh, you know, Instagram, and uh, Adventure Medical Kits. Um, they're two of the top uh, U.S. teams in the in the world right now, and um, kind of yeah, in between both those teams right now. But um, and, and everybody, Eric's a little low energy today. Will you just explain to the audience what you? So he has a real job. He's not just like you know. He doesn't. He's not like Joe where. You know, Joe has a real job in that he has his own business, but he goes to, like, he clocks in, you know. He, he has a, an actual job that he reports to. What did you do today? 
Um, so my, I'm an engineer, but uh, part of my job is also uh, tower climbing. And um, so I was uh, in Winter Park, Colorado, and um, climbed a, a tower on top of the ski resort. So, so, so when, when he's not traveling around the world doing uh, days-long adventure racing, he's climbing towers for an engineering company. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good night. Tune in. Dispatchradio.com. Appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Yeah. Woo!